Hi, it's Monday, October 7th. We're watching Hurricane Milton in the southwestern Gulf of Mexico. 24 hours ago when I made a video, this was not yet a hurricane. It was an upper end tropical storm. And right after the video was upgraded to category one hurricane, I mentioned in the video that extraordinary intensities are possible as Milton passes north of Mexico. Unfortunately, Milton is attaining those intensities just about as quickly as it's physically possible for a hurricane to attain them. So in the span of 24 hours, Milton has gone through all the categories and is now a Category 5 hurricane as it approaches the northern coastline of the Yucatan Peninsula. This is the close-in satellite shot of the hurricane right now, and you'll see the clearing eye as these colors continue to change in the center, indicating warming temperatures as subsidence sinking air continues to strengthen in the center of the hurricane. This eye is very tiny, about eight miles wide, and this indicates that the intensification trend is not yet done as long as this eye continues to warm like this. This is the aircraft reconnaissance data from the Air Force Hurricane Hunter aircraft that's flying around. The big takeaway here are these central pressure numbers from the beginning of the mission starting at 947 millibars to the latest fix at 925 millibars. The deepening rate has been about four to five millibars of pressure fall per hour, which is a truly extreme rate. And this hurricane is in rare company. And this is now one of the strongest and fastest strengthening hurricanes that you'll ever see in the Gulf of Mexico at this point. The winds measured by the aircraft in these dark salmon colors at flight level were approaching 180 to 190 miles per hour. The equivalent at the surface yields an estimated wind of about 160 miles per hour, which is now the official intensity just before this video, according to the National Hurricane Center, making this a Category 5 hurricane. This is the radar picture out of the government of Mexico. This is quite far from the radar, so this beam height is very high in the atmosphere, but you can see this very solid and tiny donut characteristic of Category 5 hurricanes, a solid circular eyewall. And the only thing that will really arrest or reverse the intensification trend at this point would be eyewall replacement cycles where a new secondary eyewall forms outside the inner one. They temporarily may have a double eyewall and the max winds tend to weaken while the overall wind field tends to broaden. And we might actually see several of these from Milton given its small size over the coming 24 to 36 hours. So fluctuations in the max intensity are likely over the coming day, day and a half. We'll see what its ultimate peak intensity ends up being. You can see that there's a hint of outer banding kind of encircling the inner eye wall right now, but because the beam height is so high from the radar, it's kind of difficult to tell what's going on here. And the, the storm is so small that traditional microwave imagery is not that useful in figuring out whether an ERC is imminent, uh, but we'll continue to look at aircraft data to figure that out over the next day or so. But the bottom line is a very extremely strong hurricane with fluctuations up and down in intensity are likely to be what you see over the next day, day and a half or two days. We'll get to the intensity forecast for Milton in a moment, uh, but I just wanna show you kind of in general where this is going. This is a good depiction of the overall track uncertainty right now. This is the ECMWF ensemble valid this morning. So you can see the cloud of possible locations of the hurricane in red numbers here, 51 different possible versions of the future. We already know that some of these are too far north because they're near and north of Scorpion Reef. The hurricane is clearly going south of Scorpion Reef based on its current position. But we've seen this model show, you know, this general cloud of possibilities as it moves into the western Florida coastline, extending essentially from Crystal River south through Tampa Bay and down towards Charlotte Harbor. That's kind of the section of coastline that most computer models are narrowing down on. There's always going to be uncertainty in the hurricane landfall. We're still, you know, on this model run, it's three days out. We're about two and a half days out in real time on the clock right now. And there's always wiggle room in the exact landfall. We never know that to a T, uh, but this is generally the section of coastline that could potentially see the eye actually coming ashore. Now, as far as the intensity goes, you know, we're not going to have a Category 5 hurricane in western Florida because conditions are going to get much more hostile for the hurricane as it comes in. The problem is, you know, it is going to be, you know, potentially Category 5 over much of its journey here. And then it's going to have, you know, limited time to succumb to the hostile conditions prior to moving into Florida. So it could remain extremely powerful and is expected to still be a major hurricane that is category three or stronger at the time it crosses the coast. And there are many reasons why this is going to be an extreme life-threatening event in some areas, you know, regardless of its maximum winds, which are not the most deadly threat with a storm like this. 
Now, this is the ECMWF showing the upper level wind flow. And at the moment, when it's north of Mexico like this, you know, it's in fairly light westerly flow aloft. So conditions are more or less ideal. There's enough oceanic heat content beneath the storm. It's not depleting it too quickly. So it's able to intensify uh, to a certain ceiling. It is physically limited, but it is going to be a category five, most likely for the better part of the next day with some fluctuations up and down due to eye wall replacement cycles. But as it starts to turn towards the northeast here, it's going to encounter this ribbon of uh, subtropical jet flow to its north. So the farther north the storm gets, the stronger the westerly flow hitting it in the backside is. That wind shear is going to, at some point, disrupt the structure of the eye wall and cause asymmetries that will cause the overall max winds to come down in the storm, which is technically the definition of weakening. And as this comes toward the shore, you'll see that this pressure value rises on the model as this strong upper level wind uh, begins to increase the shear to values in excess of 30 knots on most modeling. You'll see what this does to the hurricane structure on high resolution models like HAFS. So this is valid Tuesday afternoon when you still see this really compact eye wall. This is still a rather small hurricane, but extremely intense. So in all likelihood, a category five hurricane on Tuesday afternoon still when you're looking at this tomorrow. This is the uh, coastline of Mexico down here at the bottom. This is Western Cuba here to the Southeast. And you'll see that as the hurricane starts to move northeastward, uh, the coastline of Florida will start coming into view. This is Tampa Bay right here. This is uh, Charlotte Harbor right here on the northeastern edge of your screen. And so what you could see approaching is something that looks, you know, really scary. It could still be a category four to five hurricane at this moment when it's only 18, 12 to 18 hours out from landfall. Wind shear is expected to start disrupting the inner core. So at the last moment, you see that the southern eyewall essentially erodes due to the powerful southwesterly shear here. So right now, the expectation is for some kind of weakening to be occurring because 30 knots of shear typically impacts a major hurricane like Milton quite significantly. However, it is going to be uncertain right until the very end, just how quickly the weakening will occur and what the timing of landfall will look like relative to the evolution I just showed you. Do you get hit by something that's still a complete donut or something that is opening up on the south side? That will be very important for things like the maximum wind that folks feel, but the problem is the deadliest impact of this storm will probably not be the maximum wind, it will be the storm surge flooding on the coastline driven by this wind field. And one thing I wanna show you here is that the overall wind field, while small right now, is going to grow because as it interacts with that vertical shear and the jet stream to its north, there's a little bit of an upper level trough here causing baroclinic dynamics that cause the wind field to grow. So you'll see this field of green here dramatically expand as the hurricane is nearing Florida. You'll see the field of red, 60 mile per hour winds are stronger in red here, also expand. So you'll see that dramatic size increase as the storm is approaching Florida. So even though the max winds may be coming down, the overall size of the wind field will be growing. And unfortunately, that means it can drive more storm surge in the coastline. That's why we're communicating this as a, a highly dangerous hurricane and a possible extreme event in some of these portions of Western Florida. So you'll see it as this comes into the coast, you know, even if you're in Tampa Bay here and you might see, you know, wow, even if the eye wall disappears, you know, it doesn't look that bad when you're seeing the radar. And if this were to occur in reality, you know, you might be talking about some of the strongest winds affecting the coastline in the northern eye wall, but there's still going to be big wind, even if there's not that much rain on the south side. So even in that case, you can see what's happening at the surface and you still have hurricane force wind in Tampa Bay pushing water into these communities and changing direction fairly wildly as well. Obviously, there's a certain track for everybody that would be the worst case scenario for that particular location. And we're not going to be able to narrow down, you know, where is the landfall here? But because there's a risk of a particular track being extremely bad for each individual location, everyone that's in an evacuation zone and receiving evacuation orders really needs to heed that because there's going to be a lot of water sloshing around in a situation like this. Now, although the details of the track will matter for, you know, the worst case outcome for certain communities here, the broad impact of storm surge is going to extend across a significant swath of the Florida coastline. You know, I was talking about Tampa Bay here on this particular model prediction of the future, which may or may not verify this way. But look at all the onshore flow all the way down here into places like Charlotte Harbor 
and Fort Myers area, you know, especially if the track comes in south of Tampa, the surge here gets much worse. And even this kind of, you know, 50 mile per hour onshore flow to, you know, 60 mile per hour onshore flow into the coastline will be pushing a lot of water. It doesn't take much uh, to cause significant issues in these places from Cape Coral northward, and there are storm surge watches out for the entirety of the western peninsula of Florida. And even north of the storm track, Storm surge won't extend as far to the north of the storm as it will to the south. However, the north side of the storm will still be dangerous. As just an example, if this model track were to come to pass and the storm comes into Tampa Bay, once the storm is inland, what you end up getting is the backside crashing in. So this northwest quadrant has northwest wind that will come crashing into places like Clearwater, like Newport Ritchie, places that are going to get extensive water level rise due to the backside of the storm, even if the eye travels to your south. So just realize the situation is quite complex. Storm surge is a difficult thing but we know it's going to extend over a significant swath of the Florida coastline, and these are life-threatening hazards. Storm surge is by far the most dangerous impact from a hurricane like this. This is the H wharf, and I just want to show you, here's another you know, possible depiction from a hurricane model showing the southern eye wall starting to erode. Now, the problem here is if the storm is able to hold together long enough so that elements of moisture continue to rotate around the south side, because the storm is interacting with cold air to its north, if you're getting pieces of eyewall like this continually rotating around the south side, there's something called a sting jet that could cause a surprise for communities on the south side. I talked about how a drier south eyewall, you know, it could have less wind unless you get this wrap around like on the H wharf and you end up with big wind on the south side that you might not expect. These are winds over 120 miles per hour on this particular model run, even though there's not that much rain here. And you might wonder, well, how can that happen? And just briefly here, I'll show you uh, some of these uh, cross sections through that southern eye wall. This is a uh, height on the Y axis here and going west to east on the x-axis and what you'll see is this band of wind that's maximized very close to the ground as it's coming in on the south side that's because there's cold air here warmer air here and so all this airflow is getting shunted downward toward the surface and this causes a band of max wind this is what's called a sting jet and it's the kind of thing that when the storm is getting sheared and moving towards cold air like this hurricane will be doing if the timing is just wrong in this case uh, the wind can be much higher than you expect it to be on the dry backside of the storm. So don't sleep on the potential for extreme impacts from this, regardless of the exact track relative to you. You can see here on H Wharf, it's moving more into kind of the Crystal River area instead of Tampa Bay, like we saw on Half's A. And on all of these different possible tracks, there's a different set of impacts for each community, but there's a range of outcomes here uh, that is dangerous for most of these communities. This is the National Hurricane Center official track update from this morning, 10 a.m. Central Daylight Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, showing the storm maintaining major hurricane intensity. That's what the letter M means through this entire forecast. The storm is expected to weaken in terms of max wind because, again, the vertical shear will be eroding the inner core close to the landfall time. But that might be happening at the last minute, and so this may not have time to weaken below major hurricane status. So right now the forecast is for right here, the hurricane to still have max winds of 125 miles per hour and extremely dangerous as a result. The landfall timing has shifted a little bit slower just based on recent motion trends of the hurricane. So this is now anticipated to be around Wednesday evening when the landfall is occurring. Everything in pink here is a hurricane watch. Note that they extend well inland. The hurricane will be accelerating in its forward speed and will be taking high winds inland with it. So places all the way inland to like the Orlando Metro could be dealing with the potential for, you know, big power outages, trees coming down, things that high winds uh, create in Florida. And we, we will have significant surge as we talked about all up and down the Western Florida coastline, as far south as, you know, the Naples, Fort Myers area could see significant water level rises, Charlotte Harbor. Uh, these, this is the 
potential peak values of surge. So again, some of this will be a little bit track dependent. Obviously, if you're in Charlotte and Fort Myers Harbor, a track south of Tampa Bay is worse for you than a track north of Tampa Bay. But either way, there's going to be an extensive swath of onshore flow pushing water into these areas. So expect several feet of inundation regardless of the exact track and worse if the eye is closer to you. This is obviously something that can bury a lot of areas. I encourage you to look up your evacuation zone, know where that is, and then you can click on the storm surge inundation map at hurricanes.gov, and you can see all of these areas that could potentially be inundated. Here, red is nine feet or more of water, uh, orange is six feet or more, etc. And so you can get down to these communities and see just how much inundation is possible. This is a reasonable worst case scenario that is depicted on these maps, but that's to give you the ability to plan your risk and whether you should leave and move inland. It is the water in hurricanes that is most dangerous, usually not the wind for most people. This is the arrival time of the uh, dangerous winds, potentially as early as Wednesday morning. Again, landfall would be Wednesday evening, but this is the earliest reasonable arrival time of uh, 40 mile per hour or stronger winds. Could be as early as Wednesday morning, and you can see the corridor of risk extends over much of the central Florida peninsula, where the core of the hurricane is likely to track. And then flash flooding. Uh, going to be a big concern here, and especially north of the track. Because of the shear, we talked about how the southern eyewall might erode. That'll be true of much of the southern part of the storm as well. So when you see this coming in, you'll note there's a dry slot, and that will be a saving grace in terms of inland flooding for a lot of people on the southeastern side of the hurricane. However, you see all these bands out ahead of the storm, and so there will still be potential for flash flooding due to those but the rainfall totals will be reduced south of the track relative to north of the track where you see much heavier rain banding on all of these models because of that southwesterly wind shear, which means left of the storm track gets most of the rain. And so we'll see potential for very heavy corridors of rainfall and flash flooding extending across northern Florida and maybe even into southern Georgia as well. So you can see the risk here extending to places like Jacksonville from the I-4 corridor northward. Less risk to the south, but still moderate risk in the Miami-Dade and southeast Florida area where flooding is very easy to create, even with moderate amounts of rain. And some of these uh, rain bands with moisture out of the southeast will be raking southeast Florida well in advance of the hurricane's arrival. That's about it for this video. This is another big storm for Florida, uh, really unfortunate. I hope everyone is preparing for a Wednesday landfall. This could be a potentially extreme event for some folks, especially in the context of storm surge. So if you're in an evacuation coastal zone, please leave if uh, you are at risk. We will continue to watch this hurricane and I'll have another update tomorrow. You can follow me on X at Tropical Tibbets for more frequent updates throughout the day as I am able to post them. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.